so a very good evening to everyone and i am dr karuna senior resident in clinical hematology at institute of hematology and transfusion medicine kolkata so on behalf of isshbt i welcome you all in this meeting and it is my extreme pleasure to uh, introduce uh, dr tathagat chatterjee brigadier dr tathagat chatterjee who is our honored speaker today so uh, before that uh, just a, a little bit on uh, lymphoproliferative disorders so diagnosis of lymphoproliferative disorders can be at times challenging and so many times or so many a times we have uh, our experienced ourselves hanging in the air and as we all know it needs knowledge not only knowledge but also experience and a whole lot of ancillary tools to come to a conclusive diagnosis knowing everything about lymphoproliferative disorders can be a very daunting task and hence having an expert's perspective on the diagnosis of lymphoproliferative disorders would certainly help us all so without any delay i would like to uh, we should begin our master class and today our honored speaker is brigadier dr tathagat chatterjee he is a very well known person in the field of hematology and needs no uh, introduction at present he is a senior consultant hematology and professor of pathology at esic medical college and hospital faridabad over to you sir thank you for the introduction and good evening ladies and gentlemen uh, i have been given the you know the task as we say in army the duty to tell you all about the immunophenotypic flow cytometric analysis in chronic lymphoproliferative disorders so uh, it's a tough topic it's a difficult topic it has got lot of entities within it and now with the latest uh, who heme 5 or the who 2022 uh, fifth edition coming up and we most of us have actually read the review articles so lot of new entities have come and which has confused us further so i have adapted my lecture based on what i already knew and what i read from the review articles of who 2022 which has come in june this year so i bring greetings from this beautiful building of esic medical college i retired from the armed forces and took up the job here we have started our stem cell transplant in the last one year we have done 10 transplants already of which five are allogeneic and we have also procured a flow cytometer and we are now getting our ngs so hematology is a good subject we hope to start a super specialty program in the near future also greetings from the place where my journey started army hospital research and referral this is the place where i started my career and this is the place from where i superannuated a year back and of course the dream came true when i joined armed forces medical college pune way back so when i was in tata memorial hospital bombay training under dr borges and dr roshni chinoy you know they had this beautiful method of introducing the subject in a poetic form now let me tell you the teachers at tm is those days and i'm talking about the you know mid 90s they were brilliant not only in the subject they were brilliant in the language and they used to introduce the subject in a beautiful way now those were the days where we were following the keel classification and the working classification had also come and the real classification was knocking on the doors so here is one such snippet from leslie h sobin this is a book of pathology in verse lymphomas have t cells or p igm a or g centrocytic centroblastic names quite fantastic like ki1 or aild and even then we knew that chronic lymphatics still the best grow slower than all of the rest may go on for years with minimal fears it sells treat the host like their guest so let me tell you ladies and gentlemen this is not just poetry every line in this poetry has got the history of lymphoma within it and that's how we had brilliant teachers to whom we were fortunate to be exposed and we learned the subject the way it was supposed to be taught so when we talk of the who heme 4r heme 4r is the 2016 classification which you and i have all read the fourth revised edition that is we had the mature b cell neoplasm which involves the blood the bone marrow and some of the lymphoid organs like spleen 
And we had a lot of entities like the B cell, CLL, and the SLL, the B cell, PLL lymphoma, the SMZL or the splenic marginal zone lymphoma, hairy cell leukemia and its variant, extra nodal marginal zone lymphoma of malt, the lymphoplasmocytic lymphoma, plasma cell myeloma, the leukemic phase of mantle cell lymphoma and follicular lymphoma. These were some of the B CLPDs which were implemented in that classification. And similarly, we had the T cells and the NK cell entities like the T cell LGL, that is a large granular lymphocytic leukemia, the chronic variant of adult T cell leukemia lymphoma, the TCLL, TPLL, and of course the chronic lymphoproliferative disorders of NK cells. And these all have now been thought of in a different way in the WHO 22 classification, which is yet to be published. So when we talk of mature B-cell neoplasm and a quick look at what is coming up in 2022, that is WHO HEME-5, it comprises 12 families. And I'm referring to the L. Alachio et al. Leukemia June 2022 review articles. And significantly, there are a lot of Indian well-known personalities in this classification. Prominently, my teacher, Anita Borges, and of course, we have our good old friend, Sumit Kujral, and we have Vincent R. Rajkumar in the plasma cell neoplasm, and Shaji Kumar from Ames, New Delhi, who is now in Mayo Clinic, a authority, a world authority in myeloma. So it's a proud moment for all of us to have so many Indians in this upcoming classification. Now, the significant changes include that BPLL is no longer recognized as an entity. Why? And we always thought so. That what is this BPLL? Because long time back, I had a discussion. Are we dealing with the leukemic phase of mantle cell lymphoma? What is this BPLL? Thankfully, the pundits have now removed this because they say, in view of its heterogeneous nature, it is now considered as a variant of mantle cell lymphoma or maybe a PLL progression of a CLL, SLL, which most of us are aware of. Or maybe it's a family of a splenic B-cell lymphoma leukemia with prominent nucleoli. And we always face this dilemma of blastoid looking cells with prominent nucleoli to put them into the CLPT category. Similarly, the monoclonal B-cell lymphocytosis, the MBL, has three subcategories, which is the low count MBL, the CLL, SLL type of MBL, and the non CLL, SLL type of MBL. Also, there has been a standardization of the flow parameters in CLL as something which is essential and something which is additional. So in the essential, they have included CD5, CD19, CD20, CD23, surface or cytoplasmic kappa and lambda light chains. However, in the additional markers where it is imperative to differentiate CLL from other CLPTs, they've added CD200, CD43, CD10, CD79B, CD81, and more recently, the ROR1, additionally, a transcription factor. Going on to some of the more additions in the CLPD section of WHO HEME 5, the splenic B cell lymphoma leukemia with prominent nucleoli has now replaced hairy cell leukemia variant and all the CD5 negative BPLL. So that is a very important statement. The lymphoplasmocytic lymphoma, here they say IgM matters. What means is there are two molecular subsets of IgM now. The lymphoplasmocytic lymphoma or the world system macroglobulinemia is based on presence or absence of the MYD88PL265P mutation. So a lot of stress and a lot of trust is being given on the molecular categorization of lymphoma. Surprisingly, so much of importance to molecular, but how much of molecular this has Countries like ours have, only select labs have molecular you know, identifications. Now, the pediatric nodal marginal zone lymphoma is now a separate entity. So, a lot of importance have been given to this entity, along with the primary cutaneous marginal zone lymphoma. The follicular lymphoma is now classified as the classical follicular lymphoma, or the CFL, the follicular large B-cell lymphoma, and the unclassified follicular lymphoma. Now, grading in classical follicular lymphoma, which we all thought was useless, has now been said is no longer mandatory because it does not affect the treatment. Improved risk stratification has now come in mantle cell lymphoma. Similarly, what's new in the T cell and the NK cell lymphoid proliferation in lymphomas? Firstly, the nodal T follicular helper cell lymphoma. We are hearing so much of TFH cells in angioimmunoblastic lymphoma. So the nodal TFH cell lymphoma or the angioimmunoblastic type of lymphoma 
has replaced the term angioimmunoblastic T cell lymphoma. So the AITL is now been replaced by nodal TFH cell lymphoma, angioimmunoblastic type. Similarly, nodal TFH cell lymphoma follicular type has replaced the follicular T cell lymphoma. The nodal TFH cell lymphoma, not otherwise specified, has replaced the nodal peripheral T cell lymphoma with TFH phenotype. So some alteration in the terminology. The NK large granular lymphocytic leukemia has replaced the chronic lymphoproliferative disorders of NK cells of the 2016 edition. And the Epstein Barr positive nodal T and NK cell lymphoma, this is a new entity. This has never been included in the previous W2 in fourth revised edition. So, a lot of things. So, I've just stuck, stuck to the entities as far as relevant to this topic of CLPD. So, keeping the index hairy cell leukemia in mind, I will be discussing some of the morphological confounders of hairy cell leukemia, a case based approach to make the subject more interesting. And as you hear about the cases, you will come to know how to differentiate between various CLPDs and what are the morphological confounders. So, when we see this cartoon, morphological confounders are everywhere. You go to Bollywood, you see morphological confounders. You go to the universe, you'll see so many stars looking alike. The morphological confounders are everywhere. So, based on this, we did a lot of studies. One such study is an aplastic anemia, which is mimicking a, mimicking a hairy cell leukemia. Now, consensus guideline for the diagnosis and management of patients with classic hairy cell leukemia, a review article in blood is a must read for all the youngsters. The Mediterranean Journal of Hematology showed a morphological confounder and a CD19 negative case of hairy cell leukemia. We'll discuss that. Plasma cell leukemia masquerading as hairy cell leukemia case report. Update articles which most postgraduates read about hairy cell leukemia. Immunohistochemical analysis using the BRAF V600E mutation specific antibody. This is an original article, a must read. And then, of course, the ESMO practical guidelines for diagnosis and treatment to follow of uh, hairy cell leukemia. The immunophenotypic analysis of CD103 positive B lymphoproliferative disorders, a must read for all persons who are thinking of CLPD. This is in the famous hematopathology journal, Hairy Cell Leukemia and its Mimics. So I advise all of you to go back and do read these articles. Of course, my own articles long time back in Indian Journal of Cancer, the Hairy Cell Leukemia, when I was training at AIMS, all about the clinical pathological and ultrastructural findings. We had a fantastic EM section also in AIMS. So besides flow, we were doing EM and most of the cases, we had some fantastic findings. And of course, the AIMS decade-long experience of North Indian Hematology Center. This is from my colleague, Venkatesh. And this is a good article from AIMS. So all of you must read this because many of the CLPDs and its differential diagnosis are covered in all these articles. We go back to 1997, Margaret Uthman et al. So when she discussed lymphocytosis, she discussed under whether it was CD38 positive, CD19 negative, or CD3 negative. She called this as a plasmacytic tumor. Lymphocytosis, which are CD19 positive, now go for a CD5. Is it CD5 positive or CD5 negative? If CD5 positive, go for a CD20, which may or may not be positive. Go for a CD23, which is positive. Go for a surface immunoglobulin, which may be positive or negative. In such case, you're dealing with chronic lymphocytic leukemia or the small lymphocytic lymphoma. Now, in the CD19 positive subset, if you got a CD5 positive and further strong positive for CD20, CD23 negative and surface immunoglobulin strongly positive. What are you dealing with? You're dealing with the mantle cell lymphoma or even a lymphomatous polyposis. Now, the CD19 positive subsets, which are CD5 negative, we'll concentrate on these cases. Now, the CD5 negatives can be CD10 positive. If so, you're dealing with follicular lymphoma or a Burkitt lymphoma. If the CD5 negative subsets are further CD10 negative or CD11C positive, go ahead and do a CD25 and a CD103, which are strongly positive. You're dealing with a hairy cell lymphoma. If the CD10 negative and CD11C positive subsets are CD25 negative, you are dealing with a marginal zone lymphoma, a moltoma, or a splenic lymphoma with lympho villous lymphocytes. So similarly, you can talk of the T cells, do the abnormal CD48 ratio. If the CD4 positive cells are there, 
Do a CD25. If the CD25 is negative, you're seeding with a peripheral T cell lymphoma or even a TPLL. If the cells are CD8 positive, HIV negative, CD57 positive or CD16 positive or even CD56 positive, you're dealing with a TLGL. So this is the way an algorithm is made on how to decide what you're dealing with. So if you go systematically in the flow and maybe also in the immunohistochemistry on the paraffin block in the lymph node mass or even in the bone marrow biopsy, you are not likely to miss the diagnosis. Then we had the national guidelines in March 2008 by Gujral et al. And I was also part of this. So this was an approach to a case of CLPD. Here, the TMH Bombay people thought of minimal markers. Why? They thought that B cell NHL comprises majority of NHLs. So they use eight antibodies in a primary panel and they put an additional CD3 for a T cell marker. Why did they do this? Because they said this enables diagnosis of three important criteria: CLL, mantle cell lymphoma, and follicular lymphoma. So the markers they used were CD5, CD19, CD23, CD10, CD20, FMC7, Kappa and Lambda. And as I said, they added an additional CD3 to look at the T cell markers. So additional antibodies after the primary panel may be applied based on morphology assessment. So this was a reasonably practical method in labs, which are not, you know, having most of the antibodies. And let me tell you, these antibodies are quite costly, cocktail or otherwise. If you do the flow, the amount of money you have to put on these antibodies and the reagents is quite staggering. So I think uh, we think the TMH did a good job by putting a minimal marker panel. However, we know that it is not enough. And so we have the fluorochromes and monoclonal antibodies in CLPDs. Now this is from Brentwood's book, three laser, 10 color follow. So in this flow, they use 15 antigens. So in the violet, they use FMC7, violet laser that is, they use FMC7, CD45 and CD10 in the first tube. In the blue laser, they use lambda, kappa, 5 and 19. And in the red laser, they use 27 and surface CD3. And in the second tube in the violet, they use CD4, CD45, CD38. In the blue laser, 23, 79B, 290. And the red laser, they use a solitary CD22. So they have been able to classify most of the CLPDs using this 15 antigen, of course, with a viability type. This is our panel, which we have standardized at ESIC Medical College, Faridabad. This is the Apex Hospital of ESIC. So I get a lot of scope to work here. So we are using a 21 antigen panel. So here in the violet, we are using FMC7, CD45, CD10 in the first tube. And in the blue laser, we are using Lambda, Kappa, CD5, and CD19. And in the red, we are using CD20, CD7, and surface CD3. In the second tube, in the violet laser, we are using 4, 45, 38. In the blue, it is 23, 79B, 219. And the CD22 in the red. In the third tube, we are using only CD45 in the violet laser. 25, 103, 11C, and 19 in the blue, and CD138 for the neoplastic plasma cells in the red. And in the fourth tube, in the violet, we are using CD45 for the gating purpose. We are using CD19 in the blue, and the CD56 NK marker in the red. So with this 21 antigen and the viability dyes, we have been able to diagnose many of our cases of CLPD. Gating strategies for B cells, you can use a CD19 versus side scatter. For the T cells, you can use CD3 versus side scatter. For the viable cells, you can use CD45 versus side scatter. For the blast, you can use a CD34 side scatter. The lymphocytic gates will give you benign lymphocytes, mature lymphoproliferative disorders in the form of bright CD45 and a low side scatter. The monocytic gate will give you the CML, AML, pericell, MBS scatter plot, the bright CD45 and a high SSC. The hematogon gate will give you a low side scatter and a dimmer expression of CD45. The blast gate will give you a moderate CD45, high side scatter, DT lymphoblastic lymphoma, and large cell lymphoma. The plasma cytic gate will have a negativity for CD45 with increased forward scatter and low side scatter. Of course, you have a metastatic gate and a granulocytic gate and so on. So with this basic background, let me tell you a few cases of which the first case is a long case and then we'll have a few short cases. This is a 60 year old male who presented to the OPD with complaints of weakness, fatigability of three months with a one week episode of fever of two months with no history of bleeding, bone pains or abdominal discomfort. General examination was okay. 
cystic examination hepatosplenomegaly moderate ct scan did not reveal any deep seated lymph nodes lab investigation just showed a tlc of 19400 with absolute lymphocytosis and large atypical lymphoid cells showing polar villi so these are the cells which we saw on the peripheral smear see the arrow see the polar villi we did a bone marrow aspirate see so got similar blastoid looking cells with polar cytoplasmic and this is the inset and so the differential diagnosis since we are dealing with CLPD was SMZL, hericell leukemia variant, which we don't use these days, of course, and hericell leukemia. We did a trap stain and the trap stain was weakly positive. And as you know, trap stain is also positive in washer cells, osteoplastoma, few cases of SMZL, CLL, primary mediastinal B-cell lymphoma and mantle cell lymphoma. These days, these trap stains have been replaced with the anti-trap antibody, ABT trap, that is TRACP5A because the cytochemical stains in the hand of the you know naive person is not a good stain to do because trap has this has to be done by a perfectionist so we did a flow the fmc7 was positive and the cd10 was negative now remember uh, fmc7 positivity generally negates a cl so here the cd10 was negative fmc7 was positive the cd200 and the cd79b were both positive so that's a very important finding the CD20 was positive, 11C was negative, 25 was negative, 103 was negative, 19 was positive. So the 2 and 3 markers of T cells were negative and so were CD23 and CD20, CD5. So what are we dealing with? The positives, FMC7, 19, 20, 79P, 225. The negatives, 10, 23, 2, 3, 11C, 103, 5. What's your diagnosis? We did a bone marrow biopsy. Look at what we got. The nodular infiltration. But we also got interstitial infiltration. Again, the differential diagnosis is SMZL most likely. Variant again and hericell leukemia. We are still stuck up. We did a reticulant staining and we saw pericellular fibrosis. This is the differential diagnosis of bone marrow biopsy. In SMZL, you will get the intrasinusoidal CD20 positive tumor cells or the lymphoma cells. This is generally not seen in the hairy cell leukemia. So SMZL, remember, intrasinusoidal CD20 positive lymphoma cells. IHC showed a CD20 positive and a negative for CD3. Annexin, now this completely twisted us. Focally immune reactive. You know, annexin is never positive in such cases. It is truly positive only in classical hairy cell leukemia. Again, the differential diagnosis was the three. The clinicians had enough from us and it did a splenectomy. This was a spleen morphology. And what did we see? We did nodular pattern centered in the white pulp, the marginal zone type cells. There were CD20 positive and negative for 5, 23, 3, and cycling D. We also saw red pulp infiltration and we did an EM for polar hairy projection, which was seen in our case. Whereas in hairy cell classical, you see circumferential projection, which was not seen. So, it was screening marginal zone lymphoma. But why we were confused is because of trap positivity. Then we don't see that in SM settle. Non interpretable annexin 1. Annexin 1 is always positive in hairy cell leukemia only. Overlapping immunophenotype. And these are various studies of trap positivity in SM settle. SM settle do not generally display the trap positivity. Okay. Annexin 1, we did a normal study and we saw that normal bone marrow will show annexin 1 positivity and so will be showing the reactive lymphoid aggregates will show annexin, may not show annexin 1 positivity, but most of the normal marrow elements. So to diagnose annexin 1 positivity in a bone marrow, when we know the normal marrow elements also takes annexin 1 positivity is a difficult problem. So annexin 1 has limited usefulness because it poses positively stains many of the control cases. It is non-interpretable in 2% of de novo hairy cell leukemia. And of course, remember, due to low tumor burden, relative to the high background staining, we cannot interpret annexin 1 that easily. So these are few literature about annexin 1. So when we did the immunophenotypic scoring in this case, remember, we give a point each to the expression of each of the four markers, that is CD11C, CD103, CD25, and CD123. A score of 3 or 4 is observed in 98% of cases of hairy cell leukemia. So in our case, it was not so. Hairy cell leukemia disorders, hairy cell-like disorders, the score is generally 0 to 1, which was in our case. 
25% of SMZL can show CD25 positivity. Few cases may rarely show CD5 positivity. In such cases, the higher lymphocytosis and diffuse bone marrow involvement are seen in such cases of SMZL, which do not do well. Also, SMZL, unlike other lymphomas, lack recurrent chromosomal translocation. So these are some of the caveats by which you can identify SMZL. So you must exclude CLL. So LEF1 is a fantastic IHC markers. So it is negative. LEF1 will always be positive in CLL. To exclude mantle cell lymphoma, do a cyclin 1. In our case, cyclin D1 was negative. To exclude hairy cell, of course, annexin A1 was negative technically. And to exclude follicular lymphoma, the CD10 and the BCL6 will be negative in our case of SMZL, whereas in follicular lymphoma, you have to do CD10 and BCL6, which will be positive. So final diagnosis, clinic marginal zone lymphoma. These are the various methods of differentiating a hairy cell leukemia from an SMZL. You can read literature to find out this thing. Remember the classical immunophenotype of 103, 11C and 25 are positive in hairy cell and these are not expressed and most of the hairy cell leukemias are positive for annexin A1 which is negative in SM0. We know the treatment for the clinical hematologists who are logged in. The treatment, not all patients require such treatment. Those with HCV infection, which are commonly seen in SM0, you can offer antiviral therapy. The therapies directed at SCV infection may result in regression of the SMZ. Splenectomy is an acceptable alternative, particularly in patients with localized symptoms. 15% of cases of SMZ can transform to large B cell lymphoma. The autoimmune complications of SMZ must be known AIHA and ITP. For symptomatic patients with SMZ without splenomegaly, anemia, thrombocytopenia, or leukopenia, observation is the rule. However, most clinicians will not do that and they will start on therapy. For patients who are symptomatic and who do not have concomitant hepatitis C, rituximab is a treatment of choice rather than splenectomy. And you can monitor the cases with the levels of hemoglobin, LDH, albumin. Lessons to be learned, peripheral smear and bone marrow examination is essential. The 11C, 25, 103 and 123 panels are most important. So the minimal panel is not really answerable the one which TMH Bombay told us because they have now said put a directed panel. So the directed panel based on your morphology will be the four. Immunohistochem for 20 and DBA44 is positive in SMZ and BRAF mutations has now been standardized in ISC. This will be positive in the classical hair So with this long case, a few short cases of morphological confounders, we all know hair cell leukemia constitutes 2% of all leukemias. They commonly occur in male and are typically diagnosed in middle age. They are derived from the BRAF B600E mutant memory B cell. Reticulin fibrosis is a very important feature in hairy cell leukemia. It is not only due to synthesis, but also binding to the fibronectin in bone marrow. We have pseudocyanus formation, we have trap positivity, and we have CD25 positivity, and they are all due to the BRAF B600E mutation. The immunophenotype. Besides trap positivity, right co-expression of CD20, CD22, CD11C, expression of 103, 25, 123. Now this new marker, TPX21, which is also called TBET, annexin A1, FMC7, CD200, and cyclin D1. They lack CD5, they lack CD10. Annexin A1 is the most specific marker, which is not expressed by any B cell lymphoma. Always when you do annexin A1, you must compare your stain with a CD20. For MRD in multicolor flow cytometer, TBX21 is preferred and in IHC, BRA B600 is preferred to annexin A1 because annexin A1 stains all the myeloid and the T cells in the bone marrow as I have discussed earlier. This is the BRA mutation which you can read from Sanger sequencing and how it takes place. The first line treatment of hairy cell leukemia for asymptomatic watch and wait. No one waits these days. For symptomatic patients, we do chemotherapy in the form of cladribine and pentostatin. First CR less than two years, we can put bendamustine plus rituximab. First CR two to five years, we can put cladribine plus rituximab or pentostatin plus rituximab. First CR more than five years, cladribine and pentostatin continues. Of course, in pregnancy, you use interferon. In relapsed refractory hairy cell leukemia with a BRA B600E mutation, you can go for Vemurafenib or Devarafenib or even Moxitumab, Pazotoxex. For a BRA wild type, 
moxitumab as a toxic is a treatment of choice and these days we have alternative options of btk inhibitors now in the hairy cell like disorders we have hairy cell variant sm zetal discussed we have a new entity called sdr ps bcl that is clinic diffuse red pulse small b cell lymphoma the bpll which is now known as the leukemic phase of mantle cell lymphoma and this entity is now discarded from the latest who proposed 2022 classification the cll sll will always mimic and of course the plasma cell leukemias coming to a few short cases this is an 81 year old man evaluated for leukocytosis with 90% atypical lymphocytes and mild thrombocytopenia the atypical lymphocytes were large they were round or oval nuclei condensed chromatin often a prominent nucleolus blue gray cytoplasm scattered hairy projection resembling pro lymphocyte and the flow revealed a cd19 positive cd11 c positive cd103 positive cd25 negative this was the peripheral smear and this was the bone marrow aspirate and if you see the cells closely they look blastoid with prominent nucleoli a further hyper view see the prominent nucleoli abundant cytoplasm and some hairy like projections so what do you call this 6 to 70% abnormal lymphocyte showing pleomorphism convoluted nuclei nuclear blue cytoplasm prominent nucleoli again you call it atypical lymphocyte or is it a blast and you are confused as confused are the clinicians according to who 2016 that is the revised fourth edition hairy cell variant which is no longer used now has to be distinguished from two other b cell nucleus one the classical hairy cell and the second sm cell the variant hairy cell is a biological entity distinct from hairy cell leukemia and thank god the latest classification has identified it the morphological features were intermediate between hairy cell and pro lymphocytes the variant typically has prominent nucleoli and remember this term has now been used in splenic lymphoma with prominent nucleoli in the latest classification extreme leukocytosis is the rule unlike classical hairy cell which has pancytopenia and of course monocytopenia never takes place in variant the immunotypic features are cd20 positive 22 positive 11 c positive and 103 positive now this is as common as the classical hairy cell but unlike classical which has a bright expression of cd123 and cd25 the variant will not express cd25 and is generally dim or even negative for cd123 in addition annexing a1 which is expressed in almost 75 to 90% of hairy cell leukemia is universally recommended is negative in variant and the variant lacks the braf mutation in fact it has the map 2k notch mutation which are frequent in the variant the cd72 which we earlier knew as a dpa44 is often strongly expressed in the variant hairy cell leukemia and these are clinical details older patients are in variant splenomegalies and cytopenias are common however leukocytosis is much common reticulin fibrosis is much reduced and they are less responsive to cladrimine that is the purit analog as well as interferon now 6% of variant hairy cell will transform to rapid progression and early death and that's the danger of having a variant worst prognosis in hairy cell the median overall survival may be 9 years but this is repeated but the high tp tp53 in an unmuted ighv cases shows a poor prognosis of a variant hairy cell and these are various treatment of variant hairy cell leukemia the first line may be cladrotomic rituximab and of course moxitomic pasodox can be used or so ibrutinib in the relapsed cases the third short case is a 52 year old male with b symptoms huge splenomegaly rapidly rising tlc hemoglobin 7.2 tlc 1 lakh 20000 platelet 52000 now 72% pro lymphocytes incidentally this term is no longer used now this is a bpll cases larger than normal lymphocytes with characteristic nucleoli numerous large lymphoid cells in the peripheral blood with distinct nucleoli now we know that this is actually may be a leukemic phase of a mantle cell lymphoma or may be a part of the family of splenic lymphoma with prominent lymphocytes uh, nucleoli the leukocytosis more than 55% and usually greater than 90% of circulatory white cells are the pro lymphocytes the bone marrow is infiltrated usually in an interstitial or in a nodular pattern okay the spleen shows an expanded white pulp 
deletion 17p with tp53 is seen in more than 50% of cases of such bpll cases which are dismal in prognosis so this can be seen as a transformation of cll or as a de novo disease when de novo the blastoid transformation and see this this is what we had already considered that the blastoid transformation of a mantle cell lymphoma is often a consideration and based on our observation now the who has said that bpl is no longer an entity it may be a part of a mantle cell lymphoma family or a splenic lymphoma with prominent lymphocytes of course the underlying translocation 1114 that is igchcc and d1 has to be done to diagnose mantle cell lymphoma sox 11 is negative this is very useful in cycling d1 negative mantle cell lymphoma case 4 a 48 year old male with massive splenomegaly with gradually falling counts and this was pancytopenia see this is a case of splenic diffuse red pulse small b cell lymphoma usually splenic to be specimen gives us the answer there is diffuse infiltration of bone marrow peripheral blood and splenic red pulse by small monomorphous lymphocytes with villus projection and most importantly there is a pure intrasinusoidal bone marrow infiltration this is one of the only cases which shows pure intrasinusoidal bone marrow infiltration they are negative for nxn1 negative for 25 103 123 and cd11c igd5 and 23 they are only positive for cd20 and dpf44 which is cd72 and immunoglobulin g these are the various differences in the three entities of smzl sdrpl and hairy cell leukemia remember the most important thing is immunophenotype where sdrpl is negative for all the hairy cell markers and just positive for dpf44 and cd20 the spleen histology and many often times we see only the spleen to diagnose sdrpl the spleen histology and cytology on paraffin section shows diffuse infiltration with complete disappearance of the white pulse and predominant red pulp infiltration with small blood lakes and when you do the ihc the classical ihc markers of hairy cell leukemia are negative in such cases this is annex in a1 which is completely negative in sdrpl vis a vis hairy cell leukemia which is strongly positive the smzl lives longer the patients of smzl lives longer than the patients of sdrpl and this is one of the graph which shows the kepler hemmer graph which shows stronger survival in smz now we have a scoring system based on cd 11c cd 22 cd 76 cd 38 and cd 27 and this scoring system has now been implemented in the latest who classification we give one point each based on the rfi and based on these points we can diagnose sdrpl and differentiate it from smz cut off being three points let's come to one of the few last cases this is a 76 year old woman with pallor fatigue and body ache hemoglobin 6.7 leukocyte 6500 absolute lymphocytosis platelets 11000 now see the peripheral smear large atypical lymphoid cells with hairy and shredded cytoplasmic projections dispersed chromatin with prominent nuclei are we dealing with variant hairy cell what is this cell it is a immunophenotype side scatter cd19 gated cell cluster lacked expression of cd11 c cd23 103 and 123 so variant hairy cell was also excluded express strong cd38 strong cd138 strong cd56 with co expression and lambda light chain restriction so it was a plasma cell discretia mimicking a hairy cell leukemia the spep and the sife showed an m spike with the igg lambda the overall features were consistent with plasma cell leukemia and there are numerous such cases in the literature the readers must go through this literature to see how a plasma cell neoplasm can also mimic a hairy cell so these are various plasma cells they occasionally have hairy like projections however the morphology of plasma cell is often misleading and this case highlights the rational of plasma cell leukemia being taken as a dd and that's why you can include the plasma cell markers in your clpd panel a6 a 26 year old female with massive splenomegaly fever epistaxis has pitechi ecchymosis liver and spleen big spleen big liver this was the lab investigation 13400 tlc with atypical lymphocytes 15% of the 64% lymphocytes with thrombocytopenia 
Now this is a cell which shows atypical lymphoid cell projection. In the bone marrow aspirate, we saw middle size to large atypical lymphoid cells with pale cytoplasm, irregular nuclear contitudes, prominent nuclei. We thought they were blasts, but the MPO NSC was negative. Was it ALL? Was it hepatosplenic lymphoma? Was it SM0? Was it TLGL? So we did a flow. The 19 and 34 were negative. So blasts were negative. The 5 and 19 were negative. The 3 and the TDT. Now see this. CD3 was positive. TDT was negative. And surface CD3 was strongly positive. You see the fourth diagram? Surface CD3 strongly positive. The 4 and 8 were double negative. The TCR gamma delta was positive, TCR alpha beta was negative, surface CD3 was positive, 56 negative, 64 and 11C were negative. HLADR, MPO were both negative. So this is the cartoon which shows the flow cytometry in tabulated form. The TCR gamma delta, the surface CD3 and cytoplasm CD3 were positive. The bone marrow shows an infiltration with a monomorphic population of neoplastic lymphoid cells, CD20 negative, CD3 positive in IHC. And we are seeing the CD3 positive cells of the lymphoma cells within sinusoids. It's a classical picture. So when we do a differential diagnosis, the precursor lymphoid neoplasm is out. The mycosis fungoides are out. Nodal peripheral T cell not otherwise specified and anaplastic last cell lymphoma are out. The extra nodal enteropathy associated TCL, hepatosplenic T cell lymphoma are out. Subcutaneous paniculitis is out. So this is, then we did a lot of work on the TALL versus hepatosplenic T cell lymphoma. In hepatosplenic T cell lymphoma, the TLC is increased to thousands. The morphology shows loosely condensed chromatin, small inconspicuous nucleoli, acid phosphate is negative, CD3 positive, 56 positive, TCR gamma delta positive, granzyme positive, Perforin negative, and most important, the sinusoidal localization of the lymphoma cell in the bone. Right? So, the same thing to differentiate TPLL versus hepatosplenic T cell lymphoma. And this is the lymphoma with clinical features, cytology, histology, cell type, and phenotype of hepatosplenic lymphoma versus TLGL lymphoma. And of course, this is a cartoon which shows the NK cell leukemia, which is with the uh, difference with hepatosplenic T cell lymphoma. So the final diagnosis was hepatosplenic T cell lymphoma. A quick word about CLL and atypical CLL, which we are using very loosely these days. The normal CLL are positive for CD19, dim surface IgM or D, CD20, 22, 79 B positive, positive for 5, 43 and strongly for CD200 and CD23. 10 is negative and FMC7 is generally negative. Scoring system of modified metudes is integrated to help in the DD. The scoring proposed in the modified metude score has been the basis for the diagnosis for the past 15 years. And this is defined by strong expression of 5, 23, absent expression of 79B, surface immunoglobulin, and FMC7. Now, when you see this article, diagnosis of CLL revisited in British Journal of Hematology of 2017, they have increased the specificity by a modified five marker scoring system. They have used CD523, FMC7, 79B, CD proposed, and the CD200 has also been implemented. The atypical CLL are 5 negative, 23 negative, FMC positive, strongly positive for surface membrane immunoglobulin, unlike CLL, or even CD79B strongly positive. Here, before diagnosing atypical CLL, you must exclude CD5 negative, SMZL, before considering atypical CLL. A new IC marker, LEF1, has come. This LEF1 is always positive in CLL only. All B cell lymphomas as well as mature lymphocytes are always negative. So, in case of doubt, do an LEF1 on the lymph node. And if this is positive, you are dealing only with CLL. The lymphoplasma is nephomas, comprises of nodular, diffuse, and interstitial infiltration of bone marrow. They express surface immunoglobulin and cytoplasmic immunoglobulin. The CD19. 20, 22, 79, 38, 25, 138 are all positive. They are negative for 5, 23, 10, and 103. Remember in plasma cell lymphomas, plasma cell leukemias rather, the CD19 is negative. The CD19 and 20 are always positive in lymphoplasma setting lymphoma. So to summarize, ladies and gentlemen, the morphological differences are glaring. Whether it is hairy cell, the variant, the DRS, PCL, or SM cell, we have considered all the morphology. 
the immunophenotypic immunophenotypic differentiations are most important this is the classical immunophenotypes of the confounders you use 5 19 20 23 10 25 103 200 20, 20, 20, and surface immunoglobulin and you can differentiate a host of clpds using this markers the genetic aberrations are most important the klf2 mutations are seen in 20 to 40% of cases of smzl the prof v600e mutations are seen in classical hairy cell and the notch two mutations are seen in variants the summary of confidus we have summarized everything and finally to acknowledge the brilliant team from army hospital rnr delhi in which i had the honor to be the hod kanal ankur rauja some of the cases which i have referred here are the brilliant diagnosis of kanal ankur rauja who is a brilliant dm hematopathologist from aims kanal s venkatesan he is also a dm hematology from aims and he has been my co-author in many of my publications uday is one of the brilliant clinical hematologists now posted in afmc pune colonel aj singh kj singh and colonel devika gupta both in command hospital kolkata brilliant pathologist devika gupta is one of our youngest frc pap by examination so i'm so proud to acknowledge my members from army hospital ara who are now doing human service in hematology all over the country thanks for your patient hearing this is the arm forces pathology group of afmc army hospital ara and many of us have retired and uh, i bow down and acknowledge all my seniors in this group thank you ladies and gentlemen god bless thank you very much sir for your excellent presentation and you have demonstrated uh, quite a few number of uh, good cases and uh, you have highlighted or uh, you have covered areas where we are generally stuck as juniors so uh, after this so we uh, so will you be able to uh, this after this we have a scheduled question and answer session so okay okay so if any of the participants has any question they can ask right now uh, ma'am dr minakshi want to ask a question can i allow her with your permission yeah 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 dr minakshi you can ask a question Oh, uh, ma'am, I think she left. Okay, so, sir, I have got a question. Yes. Sir, I wanted to ask a basic question, and uh, in the uh, current era, when we have got so many uh, diagnostic techniques, what should be the optimum uh, optimal sample, and what should be the uh, history that should be with a lymph node biopsy that should be sent to a lab? like we have got a uh, apart from histopathological examination we need ipc we need a uh, flow cytometry we might be needing a uh, uh, fish for all the translocations so uh, is there something like apart from uh, formalin sample there has to be something else that needs to be sent or a, a cbc sample pbs sample has to be sent or the report has to be sent something like that sir yeah this is a good question i think uh, this is a good question for the listeners the basics who have just entered hematology i think this is a good question so basically the first and foremost thing is clinical correlation i mean as pathologists or as hematopathologists or as clinical hematologists unless and until we are talking to each other we are not going to achieve anything diagnosing a case in isolation in an ac room by a pathologist without understanding what is the clinical situation is criminal similarly the clinical hematologist not contacting or talking to the pathologist all it needs is a phone call so number one clinical correlation most important the cbc and the peripheral smear the morphology in the context of the clinical situation thereafter of course as the situation agrees to you do a bone marrow aspiration and biopsy and various ic markers in 2019 in army hospital ara we did the national lymphoma workshop as part of ishpt and we did the paraffin sections how to brush the lymphoma uh, the lymph nodes and how to do the flow cytometry on the tissues we did a national workshop so even this entity is available to you besides ihc on the lymph node which takes time you can do the lymphoma on the tissue itself in the flow cytometry besides your bone marrow aspirates and biopsy 
Then you have comprehensive fish panel, the 12Q, the 13 trisomies. There are so many issues in CLL and mental and so many things. So you have to make your fish panel, your cytogenetic panel, along with your flow cytometry. And now with the Sanger sequencing and the next generation sequencing coming, and when we know particularly the BRAF V600E mutation as specific for classical hairy cell leukemia or a NOX2 mutation as specific for variant hairy cell leukemia or SMZL. So all these plethoras are available to you. But nothing works if you are not clinically oriented and the clinicians is not pathologically oriented. You have to work as one team. And the morphology is the most important thing without which no other system will work. Thank you very much, sir, for your uh, easy explanation. And I guess everyone is helped by this. So another basic question I'm asking you so many times, uh, as long as we uh, advise excisional biopsy, it is okay. But many times uh, the surgeons, they just do a, sometimes for an um, intra-abdominal lymph node, retroperitoneal lymph node, the biopsy uh, sample is not adequate. So anything that needs to be conveyed to the surgeons, like uh, what should be the uh, See, adequate sample? As you all know, incisional biopsies will not give you the architecture, the way an excisional biopsy has. You see, as a lymphoma pathologist everywhere, we are confident once we get the excisional biopsy. Okay. But then you have to also feel for the clinicians and the radiologists and the intervention radiologists. You know, there are so many lymph nodes stuck up in places where it is not accessible. So in that case, even if you get the incisional biopsies, if you can give the basic idea that is a large visceral lymphoma or it is a marginal lymphoma, you can give a basic idea. But ideally, an excision biopsy is what you should insist for. Okay, sir. So uh, I guess uh, there are no more questions, sir. So on behalf of everyone who is present today, I am thanking you a lot, sir. And all the juniors who are present who are way more junior to you, they must have, uh, we have learned something and we are going to use it in our day-to-day -day life in the routine diagnosis of lymphomas. It was a treat uh, to listen to your presentation and uh, there was so much to write down, uh, write down upon and a uh, lot of homework you gave. You have asked us to go through the articles, so a lot of homework and a lot of reading needs to be done, but thanks a lot, sir. One thing I want to tell you, just as excisional biopsy is so important, similarly, physical talking is more important. I mean, thanks yes, to COVID, yes. But nothing like a direct interaction between the speaker yes, and the yes. students. And I'm waiting for the day when we start our regular interaction in the dais, you know, yes, talking yes. to each other, speaking to each other. You know? So I am waiting for that day when, of course, we've already started. But yeah. Zoom, Zoom and this, this is good. Virtual is good, no doubt. But the, uh, the teaching and the you know, method of conveying to our students is much more in the physical platform. So let's so just like that the case should come. Yes. So just like the tumor micro environment, that, yeah. uh, <laughs> that, that environment is lacking if there is a yes. webinar sitting at home. We need environment. Yes. And that day is not far where we will come. Okay. okay. Thank you very much, sir. Bye-bye. Okay. Good night. Thank Good you, night. Tathagat, sir. Good night, everyone. Thank you very much. Good night. God bless all of you. Bye-bye. Okay. Good night, everyone. Thank you, Corona, ma'am.